In question one, we've got figure one showing a, a circle with center O. We've got points A and B on the circumference, and we are told that the area of the major sector, it's the one shaded here in gray, is 135 square centimeters. The reflex angle AOB, so reflex means greater than 180 degrees or pi radians, so this is 4.8 radians. And we need to find the exact length in centimeters of the minor arc. The minor arc AB is this part here. So let's start by reminding ourselves that the area of a sector when the angle is measured in radians is given by a half r squared theta. So in our case, we've got 135 is equal to a half times r squared times 4.8. This leads to 135 being equal to 2.4 r squared. So if I divide 135 by 2.4, I get 56.25 to be r squared. And taking the square root of the left-hand side, the square root of 56.25 is 7.5. So that's the radius here. Now to find the exact length of the minor arc AB, Let's remind ourselves that the length of the arc is given by r theta, when theta is in radians. So in our case, the length L is given by the radius, which is 7.5, and the angle theta is not 4.8. The angle theta is gonna be two pi minus 4.8, because that's the angle in the minor sector AOB. So we've got 7.5, times 2 pi minus 4.8. If we expand this, we get 15 pi minus 36, and that's centimeters. In 2a, we've got that theta is small, and we need to use a small angle approximation for cos theta to show that 1 plus 4 cos theta plus 3 cos squared theta is approximately 8 minus 5 theta squared. Well, we know that in the formula booklet we've got the small angle approximations which are applicable for theta being in radians. And in particular, we've got cos theta being approximately 1 minus theta squared over 2, which means that 1 plus 4 cos theta plus 3 cos squared theta will be approximately 1 plus 4 brackets 1 minus theta squared over 2 plus 3 brackets 1 minus theta squared over 2 all squared. I will expand this to get 1 plus 4 minus 2 theta squared plus 3 brackets 1 minus theta squared plus theta to the 4 over 4. Notice that what I need to arrive at goes up to the theta squared term. So when I expand this, I will only be considering up to theta to the power of 2 terms. So this is 1 plus 4 minus 2 theta squared plus 3 minus 3 theta squared which gives me, of course, 8 minus 5 theta squared as required. We are then told that Adele uses theta is 5 degrees to test the approximation in part A, and this is the working given here. The calculator gave a precise answer of 7.962 correct to 3 dps, and using the approximation, she got minus 117, concluding that the approximation is not true because the two answers do not match or are not close enough. And we are told to identify the mistake made by Adele. Well, obviously, Adele was working in degrees, and we do know that the small angle approximations are only valid for radians. In II, we need to show that 8 minus 5 theta squared can be used to give a good approximation for an angle of size 5 degrees. So the first thing to do is actually deal with the mistake that Adele did. So we will be converting the 5 degrees into radians. We know that 180 degrees is pi radians, and therefore 5 degrees will be theta radians. Well, theta is simply 5 times pi over 180, which gives me pi over 36. And therefore, 1 plus 4 cos pi over 36 plus 3 cos squared pi over 36 this is the exact answer. I'm plugging this on the calculator. I get 7.96199 dot dot dot, whereas the approximation would be 8 minus 5 times pi over 36 squared, which is giving me 7.9619228 dot dot dot. 
and we conclude that since the answers are in close agreement, then the approximation is good. Question 3, we've got a cup of hot tea placed on a table. We've got a model here for the temperature of the tea in the cup, theta degrees Celsius, T minutes after being placed on the table. A is a constant. We are told that the temperature was initially 75 degrees Celsius and we need to find a complete equation for the model. So in other words, we've just been told that when T is zero, then theta is 75. This means I can substitute theta with 75 and T with zero and I get 25 plus A E to the zero. Well, E to the zero is one, so 75 is 25 plus A leading to A being 50. I'm not going to stop here. The question is asking for a complete equation for the model. So the final line should be exactly a complete equation. So we've got that theta is 25 plus 50e to the minus 0.03t. In part B, we are asked to use the model to find the time taken to cool from 75 down to 60 degrees Celsius, giving our answer in minutes to 1 dp. So in other words, we need to find the time t when theta is 60. So we've got that 60 is 25 plus 50 e to the minus 0.03 t. So if I deduct the 25, I get 35 is 50 e to the minus 0.03 t. And if I divide by 50 both sides, I get 0.7 is e to the minus 0.03 t. I will take a length of both sides, so the left-hand side becomes a length of 0.7, and on the right-hand side, I'm left with minus 0.03t, and therefore minus 1 over 0.03, a length of 0.7 is equal to t. Put this on the calculator, I get 11.889 dot 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 for t. Well, I've been asked to give my answer to 1 dp, which is that my final answer should be 11.9 minutes. Remember that we need to include the units because this is a problem in context. In part C, we have that two hours after the cup was placed on the table, the temperature was found to be 20.3 degrees. And using this information, we need to evaluate the model explaining the reasoning. So two hours means that T is 120. So when T is 120, we get theta to be 25 plus 50 times e to the minus 0 0.03 times 120. This gives an answer of 26.366. Remember, this is the temperature predicted by the model, and this is the actual temperature observed. We can see that the two are not close, so we simply say that since the 26.366 is greater than the 20.3 that was observed, then we can say that the model is not accurate. So we need to explicitly compare between the two temperatures. Since what we predicted was not close to what we have observed, then the model is inaccurate. In question four, we are asked to sketch the graph with equation y is the modulus of 2x minus 5. We've got a modulus graph here. We need to state the coordinates of any point where we cut or meet the coordinate axis. So starting with y is the absolute value of 2x minus 5. The first thing I would do is split this into 2x minus 5 if what I have inputted is positive, if 2x minus 5 is greater than or equal to 0 or minus brackets 2x minus 5 if 2x minus 5 is less than 0. Remember that the modulus sign is behaving like a normal set of brackets if the input, the expression within the modulus part is positive, and it behaves like a normal set of brackets with a negative sign outside if what I've uh, got within the modulus sign is negative. This simplifies to 2x minus 5 if x is greater than or equal to 5 over 2, and minus 2x plus 5 if x is less than 5 over 2. So essentially the graph is the union of these two half lines, the 2x minus 5 for x greater than or equal to 5 over 2, and the minus 2x plus 5 for x less than 5 over 2. Obviously we notice that something interesting happens at 5 over 2, that's the vertex, so when x is 5 over 2, we can substitute here and we see that 
y is 0 and this is the position of the vertex and therefore we can proceed to sketch the graph we've got the pair of axes here x and y from uh, 5 over 2 comma 0 the vertex and to the right we've got the graph of y is 2x minus 5 so it's a straight line going uphill whereas for x being less than 5 over 2 we've got the straight line going downhill cutting the y-axis at 5 so it's the y is minus 2x plus 5 straight line part so this v-shaped graph is the graph of y is the modulus of 2x minus 5. In part b we are asked to find the values of x which satisfy that the modulus of 2x minus 5 is greater than 7 so this means going back to my sketch here, I need to draw the line y equals to 7, which should be somewhere there. It's a horizontal line, there it is. Obviously, we've got two points of intersection, one with the part of y is minus 2x plus 5, and the other with the part of y is 2x minus 5. So let me start by finding those uh, points of intersection, the x coordinates at least. So I'm equating 2x minus 5 with... Uh, 7 and minus 2x plus 5 with 7. This leads to 2x being equal to 12 and therefore x is 6 and negative 2x being 2 so x is negative 1 and we see that we've got a cut at negative 1 and 6. Remember we've got the modulus graph to be above the horizontal line so we want this part here and this part here so we need x to be less than negative 1 or x to be greater than 6. In part c we are asked to find the values of x which satisfy the modulus of 2x minus 5 being greater than x minus 5 over 2. So I will start by considering the line y is x minus 5 over 2. So it's a straight line, it's going uphill, we can see that when x is 0, we get that y is minus 5 over 2, whereas when y is 0, I need to solve 0 is x minus 5 over 2, which leads to x being 5 over 2. So if we just revisit the graph of y's modulus of 2x minus 5, the graph of y is x minus 5 over 2 will be a straight line passing through the vertex at 5 over 2 comma 0 because the x-intercept of this straight line happens to be the vertex itself. Remember we want the modulus graph to be above the straight line part and we can see that this is always satisfied apart from the exact spot of the vertex. We need to give our answer in set notation so this means that all values of x such that x belongs to the reals apart from 5 over 2 would satisfy the given inequality. In question 5 we've got the straight line L with equation 3x minus 2y is k, k is a real constant and we are told that this line intersects the curve y is 2x squared minus 5 at two distinct points and we need to find the range of possible values for k well, we could equate these two, treat them as a system of simultaneous equations leading up to a quadratic. Hopefully, for two distinct points, this should have a discriminant which is strictly positive, and this should lead to an inequality for k. So starting with 3x minus 2y is k, I will try to make y the subject of the formula. So we've got 3x minus k is equal to 2y. Dividing throughout by 2, I get 3x minus k and all of it over 2 is equal to y. And I will substitute in the second equation y with 3x minus k over 2. This leads to 3x minus k over 2 is equal to 2x squared minus 5. I will multiply throughout by 2 to get rid of the fraction. So 3x minus k is 4x squared minus 10 leading to 0 being 4x squared minus 3x plus k minus 10. For an intersection at two distinct points, this implies that the discriminant is greater than 0. We know that the discriminant is b squared minus 4ac. a is 4, b is negative 3, and c is k minus 10. So we've got minus 3 squared minus 4 times 4 times k minus 10 
is greater than zero, leading to nine minus 16 K plus 160 is greater than zero, and therefore we've got 169 being greater than 16 K, which leads to 169 over 16 being greater than K. In question six, we've got f of x, eight minus x, ln x. The sketch is given here. We've got cuts on the x-axis at A and B and the maximum turning point at Q. We need to find the x-coordinate of A and the x-coordinate of B. So obviously at A and B, we've got x-intercept, so y is zero. So I will be substituting y is zero here, leading to zero is eight minus x, times ln x, so we've got either 8 minus x being 0 or ln x being 0. This means that 8 is x or x is e to the 0, which turns out to be 1, and therefore we conclude that point A has coordinates 1, 0, it's the one on the left, and point B has coordinates 8, 0, as it is the one on the right. In B, we need to show that the x-coordinate of Q, the point Q is the maximum turning point, satisfies the given equation here. Well, starting from the equation for y, y was 8 minus x ln x. For a maximum turning point, we need dy dx, which we will be setting equal to 0. So dy dx here, we've got the product rule. It's the product of 8 minus x and ln x, two functions of x. The derivative of 8 minus x is simply negative 1, and I keep ln x, plus I keep the 8 minus x, and I differentiate the ln x to give me 1 over x. So this gives me minus ln x plus 8 minus x over x. I will be setting this equal to 0 as we're looking at a turning point. I will multiply throughout by x to get minus x ln x plus 8 minus x is equal to 0, which leads to 8 is equal to x plus x ln x. I factor out the x on the right-hand side to give me 8 is x brackets 1 plus ln x, leading to 8 over 1 plus ln x is equal to x as required. In C, I have to show that the x-coordinate of Q lies between 3.5 and 3.6. Obviously, we will be looking for a change of sign. And remember, whenever you're looking for a change of sign, you always substitute the 3.5 and the 3.6 in what you need to be equal to zero. So let me start by stating that we consider the derivative f dash of x, which was found to be minus ln x plus eight minus x over x. I will be substituting the 3.5. So f dash of 3.5 is minus ln of 3.5 plus 8 minus 3.5 over 3.5, which gives an answer of 0 0.03295, whereas f dash of 3.6 is minus ln of 3.6 plus 8 minus 3.6 over 3.6. Plug this on the calculator, you get minus 0 0.05. 871. Therefore, we conclude that there's a change of sign and f dash of x is continuous, hence the x coordinate of q lies between 3.5 and 3.6. Remember that you need to mention both the change of sign and the continuity of f dash of x to get the mark here. In part d, we need to use the iterative formula given by xn plus 1 is 8 over 1 plus ln of xn starting with x1 is 3.5 to give the value of x5 to 4 dps, and then the x-coordinate of q accurate to 2 dps. So we are starting this iterative process with x1 being 3.5. What I can do is get my calculator, I press 3.5, I press the equal sign, I've just stored it on the calculator, and therefore I'll be doing 8 over 1 plus ln of ans. Every time I press the equal sign, it's an iteration. So the first iteration will take me to x2, which is 3.5512. If I press it again, I get 3.5285. I'm quoting answers to 40 pieces as instructed. 
If I keep pressing the equal sign, I get x4 to be 3.5385 and x5 to be 3.5340. To find the x coordinate of q accurately to two decimal places, I will just keep pressing the equal sign until I see that the answer has stabilized. So if I do this a, a large number of times, we see that we eventually settle at x is 3.54. In question seven, we've got a bacterial culture with an area of p square millimeters t hours after being placed onto a circular dish. We've been suggested that at time t hours, the rate of increase of the area of the culture can be modeled as being proportional to the area of the culture. And we need to show that this leads to an exponential model of the form P is A e to the kt. Well, starting from the fact that the rate of increase of the area is proportional to the area of the culture, we can write a differential equation that says that dp dt, p is the area t is the time, is proportional to p. I go from a proportionality relation to an equation by introducing a constant of proportionality k. So dp dt is kp. And therefore, I can now separate the variables. 1 over p dp is equal to k dt. And I integrate both sides. This leads to ln p is equal to kt plus ln a. I will collect the lns on the left hand side. So we've got ln p minus ln a is equal to kt leading to ln of p over a is equal to kt and therefore p over a is e to the kt leading to p is a e to the kt which is exactly the model given in the question so as required. We are then given some additional information that plotting ln p against t shows that Points lie close to a straight line with a gradient of 0.14 and a vertical intercept of 3.95. In other words, we can draw a straight line, we can feed a straight line with an equation of ln p, that's my y, is equal to 0.14t plus 3.95. Remember the 0.14 was the gradient and the 3.95 was the y-intercept. On the other hand, we had before that ln p is kt plus ln a. So let me write this on the side. So ln p is kt plus ln a. So if I just compare the two, I can see that the 0.14 must be my k and the 3.95 should be the ln a. So let me just state that k is 0.14 and ln a is equal to 3.95 and therefore a is e to the 3.95 which gives 51.935 dot 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 i've been told to give the value of a to two significant figures so this is equal to 52. We are then told that the model can be written in the form P is A, B to the T, where B should be given to three significant figures. Well, we know that P is A, E to the K, T. We have found A to be 52 and K to be 0.14. So we're looking at 52 E to the 0.14 T, which can be written as 52 e to the 0.14 and all raised to the power of t. The reason is that when I've got a power raised to a power, I multiply the indices together so we can see that this is the right thing to do. And e to the 0.14 is 1.15. So the model is 52 times 1.15 to the power of t. In part D, we are asked to interpret the values of A and B with reference to this model. We need to give statements and interpretations in context. So we found A to be 52. We can see that when T is 0, 1.15 to the 0 is 1. So we're left with 52. 
So A being 52 means that we are looking at the initial area in squared millimeters for the bacterial culture. It's a good idea to include the units each time you give an answer for a modeling question. And for B, we can see that every time that T increases by 1, we are essentially multiplying by 1.15. Well, a multiplying factor of 1.15 corresponds to an increase of 15%, and therefore we conclude that every hour the area increases by 15%. And finally, we are asked to state the long-term limitation of the model for P. Well, we can see that it's an exponential model, so as T grows to infinity, the 1.15 to the T goes to infinity, and therefore this simply means that under this model, the area will be increasing indefinitely. However, the size of the circular dish within which this culture is contained has a finite area, and obviously that's a limitation for this particular model. In question 8, we've got a bowl here. It's initially empty. Water begins to flow into the bowl. The volume is given in terms of H, the height in centimeters. And we are told that the flow of water is uh, happening at a constant rate of 160 pi cubic centimeters per second. We need to find the rate of change of the depth of the water in centimeters per second when H is 10. We're looking at the units centimeters per second, so this must be dH dt. Let me start by stating what I've been given. dV dt, the rate of change of volume with respect to time, is 160 pi. It's positive because we've got the volume increasing. We can also write an expression for V in terms of H. I will expand what I've been given here. This gives me 25 pi H squared minus a third pi h cubed, which means that dv dh is given by 50 pi h minus pi h squared. Now we'll use the chain rule to write dh dt in terms of the other derivatives. So it's going to be dh dv times dv dt. Now dh dv is simply the reciprocal of this. So I will be writing 1 over 50 pi h minus pi h squared, and the VDT is 160 pi. All that is uh, left to be done is evaluate this when h is 10. So dH dt at the h is 10 is equal to 160 pi over 50 pi times 10 minus pi times 10 squared. Plug this on the calculator, you get 2 over 5, and the units are centimeters per second. In part B, we are told that the flow of water is increased to a constant rate of 300 pi cubic centimeters per second, and we need to find the rate of change of the depth of the water when age is 20. So this means that dv dt is now equal to a constant 300 pi. So we still have that dH dt is equal to dH dv times dV dt. So we had from part A that uh, dH dv is 1 over 50 pi h minus pi h squared, and dV dt is 300 pi. We need to evaluate this at h is 20, so dH dt at h is 20 is equal to 1 over 50 pi times 20 minus pi times 20 squared times 300 pi. Plug this on the calculator, the answer is a half centimeters per second. In question 9, we've got a circle centered at point A3, negative 1, passing through P with coordinates minus 9, 8, and Q with coordinates 15, negative 10. We need to show that PQ is a diameter of the circle. It makes sense to draw a quick sketch. I've got a circle centered at A3, negative 1. PQ has to be shown to be a diameter with the given coordinates. One approach to prove that PQ is indeed a diameter is to go for the midpoint of PQ. 
if I find that the midpoint of PQ is point A, then I'm done. So the midpoint of PQ, I will simply be doing the midpoint of the x-coordinates and the midpoint of the y-coordinates. So it's going to be minus 9 plus 15 over 2, comma 8 plus negative 10 over 2. This is giving me 3, negative 1, which is indeed point A. And therefore, we conclude that since the midpoint of PQ is A, then PQ is a diameter of the circle. We are then told to find an equation for the circle. I will start by finding the length of the radius. So the radius is simply going to be the distance between either of these two points and the center. So I'm going to pick P. So it's going to be 8 minus negative 1 squared plus minus 9 minus 3 squared and all square root. This is giving an answer of 15. We know that the circle centered at alpha beta having radius r has equation x minus alpha squared plus y minus beta squared is r squared. So in our case, x minus 3 squared plus y plus 1 squared is equal to 15 squared will be the equation of the circle. We are then told that there's a point r on the circle and the length of the chord pr is 20 units. And we need to work out the length of the shortest distance from A to the chord PR, giving our answer as a third in its simplest form. So I'm going to draw the chord PR somewhere here. So we've got the point R here. This has a length of 20 units. If I draw this here connecting R with Q, we've got a right angle here. We need to find the shortest distance between the center of the circle and the chord. So I'll be drawing a line from the center to the chord. The shortest distance is perpendicular like this. I will call this x. We have already established that the radius is 15. So this here is 15. The chord is 20 units long. So this must be 10. And therefore I can use Pythagoras theorem within this right angle triangle to establish the value of x. So we've got that x squared plus 10 squared is 15 squared. So we've got x squared plus 100 is 225, leading to x squared being 125, which means that x is the square root of 125, which simplifies to 5 root 5 units. And finally, we are asked to find the size of the angle ARQ, giving our answer to the nearest 0.1 of a degree. Going back to our diagram here, ARQ, I will draw the radius from A to R. This is the one here. And this is the angle we're trying to find. I will call this theta. Notice that this angle here was 90 degrees. This angle here is also 90 degrees as it is an angle in a semicircle and therefore this here and these are parallel. So finding theta over here is the same as this angle here because we've got a z here, we've got alternate angles. So this here is also theta and we have already established that uh, the x is 5 root 5, the radius is 15, the length here is 10, so I've got everything. I could use simple SOCAPTOA, so I could say that sine of theta is opposite 10 divided by hypotenuse 15 to find the angle theta. So sine of theta is 10 over 15, which means that theta is shift sine of 10 over 15. This gives an answer of 41.810 dot dot dot, which correct to one decimal place is 41.8 degrees. In question 10, we've got a sketch of the curve defined parametrically through x is ln of t plus 2 and y is 1 over t plus 1 for t greater than minus 2 over 3. And we need to state the domain of values of x for the curve C. So let's start by 
seeing the condition on t, t is greater than minus 2 over 3, and we need to reconstruct uh, x based on this. So if I add 2, I can see that t plus 2 is greater than 4 over 3. I have added 2 on either side of the inequality. If I take a length of both sides, I see that the length of t plus 2 is greater than a length of 4 over 3, and the left-hand side is exactly x, and therefore we conclude that x is greater than a length of 4 over 3. In B, we need to find the finite region R, shown shade that it says on the figure, from x is ln 2 up to x is ln 4, and we actually need to arrive at the exact answer of a length of 3 over 2. So let's start with the basics. R is the integral from ln 2 up to ln 4 of y with respect to x. Now, unfortunately, we do not have y in terms of x. We've got y in terms of t. It's a parametric integration problem. So I need to have the integral of y dx dt dt in order to make this make sense in mathematical terms. The limits of ln2 and ln4 need to be converted into t limits, and I also need to find dx dt. So let's start by stating that x is ln of t plus 2, which means that dx dt is going to be 1 over t plus 2. Remember, the derivative of the inside is 1. The derivative of ln is 1 over, so dx dt is 1 over t plus 2. It's time to change the limits when x is ln 2. We see that this is ln of t plus 2, and we've got 2 is t plus 2, so obviously t must be 0, whereas when x is ln 4, we've got this to be equal to ln of t plus 2, and therefore we've got 4 is t plus 2, so we get that t is 2. So the new limits are 0 and 2. So we are looking at the integral from 0 to 2 of y, which was given to be 1 over t plus 1, times dx dt, which is 1 over t plus 2 dt. And now we need to use partial fraction to decompose this into partial fractions and proceed via integration. So we've got 1 over t plus 1 t plus 2 to be decomposed into the form of a over t plus 1 plus b over t plus 2. So 1 is equal to a times t plus 2 plus b times t plus 1. I'm going to choose the value of t to be negative 2 in order to eliminate the first bracket, and we get that 1 is equal to b times minus 2 plus 1. So we've got 1 to be negative b, and therefore this means that b is negative 1. The other nice value for t will be negative 1. So if t is negative 1, I get 1 is a times minus 1 plus 2, leading to 1 is equal to a. And therefore we conclude that 1 over t plus 1, t plus 2 can be decomposed into 1 over t plus 1 minus 1 over t plus 2. And therefore, the integral now, the r, becomes the integral from 0 to 2 of 1 over t plus 1 minus 1 over t plus 2 dt. Now, the integral of 1 over t plus 1 is ln of t plus 1 minus ln of t plus 2 and I'm integrating between 0 and 2. So I'm going to substitute the upper limit of 2, so it's ln of 2 plus 1 minus ln of 2 plus 2 minus the lower limit substituted. It's going to be ln of 0 plus 1 minus ln of 0 plus 2. Now ln of 1 is uh, 0, so this one here is 0. So I'm left with ln 3 minus ln 4 plus ln 2. So this is giving me ln of 3 times 2 over 4. Because when I've got addition, it's multiplication, so 3 times 2. And when I've got subtraction, it's division. 
So 3 times 2 over 4 is obviously ln of 3 over 2, which is exactly the form that I was asked to arrive at, so as required. In question 11, we've got that the second, third, and fourth terms of an arithmetic sequence are 2k, 5k minus 10, and 7k minus 14, respectively, for k being a constant. And we are asked to show that the sum of the first n terms of the sequence is a square number. Well, we know that in an arithmetic sequence, the difference between consecutive terms is constant. It's always the same. So we've got that u2 minus u1 is equal to u3 minus u2 is equal to u4 minus u3, etc. So in this case, we've got that 5k minus 10, the u3, minus u2, which is 2k, is equal to 7k minus 14 minus the 5k minus 10. So we are setting up an equation for k based on the fact that we've got three consecutive terms of an arithmetic sequence. The left-hand side gives me 3k minus 10, and on the right-hand side we've got 7k minus 14 minus 5k plus 10, leading to 3k minus 10 is equal to 2k minus 4, and therefore k is equal to 6. Now that I have established that k is 6, I can proceed in finding u2. u2 was 2k, so it's 2 times 6, which is 12. u3 is 5k minus 10, so it's 5 times 6 minus 10, which gives an answer of 20. We can see that I go from 12 to 20 by adding 8. This means that the difference is 8, the 20 minus 12. And to find u1, I will simply take u2, which is 12, and deduct 8. So u1 is 4. That's the first term of the sequence. Well, we know that the sum of the first n term of an arithmetic sequence is given by n over 2 brackets 2a plus n minus 1d. So in our case, Sn will be n over 2. And we've got 2 times 4, the first term, plus n minus 1 times 8. This leads to n over 2, brackets 8 plus 8n minus 8. Obviously, the 8 with the negative 8 cancel out. So Sn turns out to be 4n squared, which can be written as 2n all squared. And therefore, we conclude that this is a square number. Remember, we had to show that the sum of the first n terms of this arithmetic sequence was a square number. So we need to have a conclusion at the end verifying exactly what we have seen. In question 12, we've got a curve C defined by sine x plus cos y is a half. Well, x can be between minus pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2, whereas y can take values between minus pi and pi. We are told there is a point P on the curve C such that the tangent to C at the point P is parallel to the x-axis, and we need to determine the exact coordinates of all possible points P. Well, starting from sine x plus cos y is equal to a half, I will be using implicit differentiation to obtain an expression for dy dx. So we differentiate from left to right, applying all rules as usual. If we happen to differentiate a term in y, we need to put a dy dx term as well. So we've got the derivative of sine x is cos x. The derivative of cos y is minus sine y dy dx. And the derivative of a half is obviously 0. We know that if we are parallel to the x-axis, so if the tangent drawn is parallel to the x-axis, then simply means that dy dx should be equal to 0. So going back to our expression, this should be 0. And therefore, we need to solve cos x is 0. If I do shift cos of 0, I find my PV to be pi over 2. And therefore, we've got x is plus minus the PV of pi over 2 plus 2 pi k. So if I put k to be 0, I get x is pi over 2, or x is minus pi over 2. 
These are the only solutions within the range of x. x, remember, is between minus pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. Minus pi over 2 is included. That's why it's one of the solutions appearing here. So it's time for me to substitute each of these solutions into the original to find the corresponding values for y. So for x being pi over 2, we've got sine of pi over 2 plus cos y is equal to 0 0.5, which means that 1 plus cos y is 0 0.5, leading to cos y being minus 0 0.5. So I need to solve this trigonometric equation now. The PV is shift cos of minus a half, which turns out to be 2 pi over 3. And therefore, y is plus minus the PV of 2 pi over 3 plus 2 pi k. We can see that the only solutions within the range for y are 2 pi over 3 and minus 2 pi over 3. Whereas for x being negative pi over 2, I will substitute into the equation for the curve. So sine of minus pi over 2 plus cos y is a half. So minus 1 plus cos y is a half, leading to cos y is 1.5. Obviously, we have no solutions from this trigonometric equation. We say that we reject this, it's not valid, simply because cos of y should be between minus 1 and 1. This means we have ended up with two points, the pi over 2, comma, 2 pi over 3, and the second point is pi over 2, comma, minus 2 pi over 3, so in total two points. In 13a, we are asked to show that coseg of 2x plus cot 2x is equal to cot x. So this is an identity. I will start from the left-hand side, which has been given to be coseg 2x plus cot 2x, and the objective is to reach the right-hand side, showing every single step in every detail. Well, coseg of 2x is 1 over sine 2x, and cot 2x is cos of 2x over sine of 2x. I notice that the sine 2x is a common denominator, so I can express everything over the denominator of sine 2x. So this is 1 plus cos 2x over sine 2x. Well, the cos 2x, the double angle for cosine, has three versions I could use. I would actually choose the one that goes to cos squared x minus 1 because the 1 with the minus 1 will cancel out. For the denominator, the double angle for sine 2x gives me 2 sine x cos x. And I notice that the 2 with the 2 will cancel out. The cos square with the cos x will cancel out. And I'm left with cos x over sine x, which of course we can recognize as cod x, which is the right hand side as required. And then in part B, it says, hence, or otherwise, solve the given trigonometric equation. Theta is between 0 and 180. Well, we notice the resemblance between what we have to solve here and what we have proven in the identity. So we can see that 2x is now 4 theta plus 10. So let me start by writing exactly this. 2x is 4 theta plus 10. If I divide throughout by 2, I get x is 2 theta plus 5, and therefore I can write the left-hand side as simply cot of x, so cot of 2 theta plus 5 is equal to root 3. Now I will take the reciprocal of both sides, so cot gives me tan of 2 theta plus 5, and the reciprocal of root 3 is 1 over root 3. My PV is shift tan of 1 over root 3 which is 30 degrees. And therefore, we have that 2 theta plus 5 is the PV plus 180K. I will deduct 5 to give me 2 theta is 25 plus 180K. And dividing throughout by 2 gives me theta is 12.5 plus 90K. Well, remember that theta can take values between 0 and 180. 
So if I put k to be 0, I get theta to be 12.5. And if I put k to be 1, I get 102.5. These are the two solutions within the range of values for theta. In 14i, we need to investigate the claim that 3 to the x is greater than or equal to 2 to the x. And actually, we need to determine whether it's always true, sometimes true, or never true, justifying our answer. I will start by considering two cases. I start by considering x to be 1. So considering x to be 1 gives me that 3 to the 1 is 3, which is greater than 2, which is 2 to the 1. And therefore, we conclude that for x is 1, this is true. And if I consider x to be negative 1, we see that when we have 3 to the minus 1, this is a third, which is obviously less than a half, which is 2 to the minus 1. So we see that the claim fails for x being negative 1. We have shown one case where it is true and one where it is false. Hence, we conclude that sometimes it's true, sometimes it's false, so hence sometimes true. In II, we need to prove that the root 3 is an irrational number. I will be employing the proof by contradiction. It's arguably the most challenging part of the A-level syllabus because we need to construct a solid mathematical proof. And the proposition is that root 3 is irrational. This means that it cannot be written as a fraction where the numerator and the denominator are integers. So the starting point is assuming the opposite. So we say suppose not, which means that root 3 is rational. So if root 3 is indeed rational, this means that we can write root 3 as m over n, where m and n are integers, so where m n belong to the set of the integers, that the z. n cannot be 0, obviously, because I have division by 0. And also, I need to state with no common factors. This is going to be the key point when I proceed with my proof. So all I'm saying here is that if root 3 is indeed rational, then it can be written as a simplified fraction. So when we say no common factors, it means that m and n is a simplified fraction, there are no common factors, and I proceed based on that. The obvious thing to do now is square everything, leading to 3 is m squared over n squared. I will cross multiply to get 3n squared is m squared, and I can see that the left-hand side is 3 times an integer, so it's a multiple of 3, and therefore I write that m squared is also a multiple of 3. Well, we know that if m squared is a multiple of 3, then m is also a multiple of 3. And therefore, I can proceed in expressing m as 3 times k for some integer k. And I will now go back over here, substitute m with 3k. So we've got 3n squared is 3k all squared leading to 3n squared is 9k squared, and therefore n squared is 3k squared. It's a very similar scenario because now I see that the right-hand side is a multiple of 3, and therefore I can say that n squared is a multiple of 3. And if n squared is a multiple of 3, then it must be the case that n is a multiple of 3. And this is exactly the contradiction because we have just shown that both m and n are multiples of 3. But remember, we started off saying that they had no common factors. And yet, here I am now stating that they have a common factor of 3. So all we need to do now is say m and n have a common factor of 3. This is obviously a contradiction, contradicting the fact that they had no common factors, and therefore we conclude that root 3 is irrational. So the whole idea is assume the opposite of what we need to prove. So we needed to prove that root 3 is irrational. We say, let's assume the opposite. Let's say that root 3 is rational. This has led to a contradiction. So this assumption is wrong. Its opposite is true, and its opposite is exactly what we needed to prove. So root 3 is indeed irrational.